Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome to this webinar on combating ransomware attacks. My name is Mandana White and I'm the CEO of Smart Grid Forums and I'll be your host for today. So before we get started with the programme, I'd just like to run through a few administrative details with you to ensure the smooth running of the, uh, of the webinar for you. Um, first, just a quick tour of the platform. It's very um, simple and uh, easy to use. Here on the right hand side, you'll see that there's a chat panel. Uh, the purpose of this panel is for you to introduce yourself, say hi, uh, flag any technical issues you might be having, um, and just generally interact with the other participants. The audience cannot be seen or heard other than through this chat panel. So that's the purpose of that panel. To post a question, you can use the ask a question link at the bottom of your page here. Um, so just click on that, post your question. Please uh, mention the speaker that your question is for and also um, take the opportunity to upvote any questions that are already there that you'd like to see prioritized for addressing. And now at the end of the webinar today, we're going to send you an email with a link for you to download all the PowerPoint presentations from the speakers. We'll also have a few survey questions to ask you. So please take a few minutes to answer those. It's really valuable um, information for us to help us continually improve the quality of our programs for you. So please do take a few minutes uh, to answer those. And also we'll be um, posting this, uh, the, the recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel in a few days. So you'll be able to um, alert your colleagues in other departments and other companies who might like to view it in their own time as well. So uh, with that, I'd like to wish you a really um, enjoyable and productive webinar today. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the day, who is Roya Gordon, Energy Cyber Threat Intelligence Manager at Accenture. So Roya joined iDefense Accenture Security as a resources and industrial control systems focused cyber threat senior consultant in 2019. Before that, she worked at Idaho National Laboratory, one of the national laboratories of the United States Department of Energy, where she amassed experience in cyber threat analysis and assessments for the US energy infrastructure. She holds an MA in global affairs with a focus on cyber warfare and a BA in international relations. Roya also served six years in the United States Navy as an intelligence specialist. And Roya is going to kick off the program for us today by looking at the factors that are driving the explosion of ransomware attacks worldwide and looking at how these trends are likely to impact the power grid um, in the next two to three years. So over to you, Roya. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Happy to be here. All right. Good day, everyone. I'm here based in Houston, Texas. So um, yeah, good morning. Um, let me go ahead and get right into it. Okay, so this is what I'll be going over today. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the energy cyber threat landscape. And then I do want to kind of touch on some very important policies that happened in the United States as a result of some recent um, ransomware and kind of cyber um, threat activity in the energy space. And I do want to go over the Colonial, Colonial Pipeline ransomware event, not get into too much details because, you know, I'm sure everyone's been hearing it left and right for the past month or so. But um, some key takeaways from that incident that could further kind of change the threat landscape in the energy sector. All right. Um, I love this visual because it kind of gets everyone on the same page as to what's going on because there's been a lot going on since 2020. So here's a 2020-2021 chain of events. So, um, you know, the Colonial Pipeline ransomware incident um, was attributed to a dark side ransomware variant. And I'm going to get into why it's not the ransomware group that's behind it, but you know, it's, it's the ransomware variant. So that was active in August of 2020. Um, so this isn't the first time that DarkSide was uh, active. It actually targeted two other oil and gas companies leading up to Colonial Pipeline, as well as um, a plethora of other types of companies in different industries. So that happened. And then the solar winds exploitation happened in December of 2020, where um, you know, FireEye got compromised, you know, all of their pen testing tools, and then a couple of other companies that uploaded the, the update. Um, so this kind of led to the government, the U.S. government taking action, implementing a 100-day plan, uh, drafting an executive order. Now, while the executive order was in draft, the Colonial Pipeline incident occurred um, around May 7th. So 
you can kind of see why some people think, oh, you know, the executive order happened because of Colonial. It was really as a result of solar winds. But the, the, the TSA pipeline directive that kind of is the first policy we've seen regulating uh, U.S. Oil, uh, oil and gas pipelines, that was a direct result of the Colonial Pipeline incident. So um, this is kind of, you know, what I'll be going over the flow of, you know, executive order, Colonial Pipeline, then get into TSA directive. But um, yeah, first and foremost, let's get into these trends because I know I only have about 10 minutes. And of course, on the panel, you guys can ask me to deep dive into any one of these slides. Okay, so increasing attack vectors. Of course, we know that um, everyone pretty much shifted from working from home for the past year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And what this did is it opened up a lot of attack vectors for threat actors because people are working from home. You know, they don't know anything about security, how to secure their networks, how to have strong, you know, Wi-Fi passwords. So a lot of threat actors, um, they started taking advantage of that and exploiting um, VPN and remote desktop protocol. Now, these have been targeted already on the dark web, and we've seen threat actors targeting them. But again, the attack surface is expanded. So we're seeing a lot more um, uh, targeting of RDP and VPN. Another, which is really important, is delay in patching. And this, um, it specifically affects companies with critical assets and OT environments because you're not able to implement patching on a timely basis. You have to schedule it. Um, you know, due to um, not wanting interruptions in your OT environment. But there are threat actors that are actively targeting that window between um, patch um, uh, creation and patch implementation. So it's called um, one day vulns or end day vulns. So, you know, when a software vendor comes out and says, hey, we have a patch for this exploit, it's kind of like a race to see is the, the company going to patch before the threat actor can can get to it and exploit it. And this makes it easier for threat actors because they don't have to do any research. They don't have to try to find zero days. Um, they can just go on whatever software vendor's website and see, oh, there's this, these patches have been released and we know everyone isn't patching the next day or, you know, with patch prioritization, maybe they're not getting to certain patches until later on. But yeah, um, it's called a fox kitten campaign and um, it's ongoing. So um, uh, delay in patching definitely increases those attack vectors. Another one is third parties. And I, I did put third party slash supply chain companies because there's been a lot of unconventional companies that are part of the energy value chain or affiliated with the, ener uh, with the energy sector that isn't necessarily um, a vendor. So um, we have uh, law law firms that do a lot of regulatory stuff and you know in energy um, that's being targeted because of the valuable data that they do have on energy companies. We have cabling companies, satellite companies, um, and when those companies get, they undergo ransomware attacks, and you know their data is put on name and shame websites. A lot of the data is from large, you know, mining companies and oil and gas companies and things like that. So threat actors are realizing, hey, you know, we can get to our bigger targets by way of these third parties that are um, less secure because there is less revenue. So it, it doesn't really matter if the company is large or small, threat actors can still kind of utilize those smaller third parties um, in order to get to their intended target. Next, I want to talk about the cyber criminal business models. This is, you know, super interesting. Um, and I'm going to go to the next slide real quick while I, I kind of talk about this because I love the diagram. It kind of helps everyone better understand, you know, how this works. So this is just one of the, the business models that these um, dark, um, dark web threat actors use. Um, there's a total of four. But I want to highlight this model because it's the same model that we've seen in the, the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack. So you have the developer that sits at the top. They're the ones um, developing the ransomware. And that's all they do. They just create this really cool ransomware. And then um, it kind of goes through a whole bunch of people before it even gets to its target. So you have the developer that utilizes managers on different dark web forums. And then from there, they kind of solicit the sale of the ransomware to these affiliates. Now, the affiliates can be um, different types of threat actors. The affiliates could be what we, we call network access brokers, and their job is to um, get net network access to companies. A lot of the times they get it by uh, VPN and RDP. We've seen that before. Um, sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll use different pen testing tools, but their job is to obtain access to the network, and then they pretty much buy the ransomware from the developer. So they kind of did half of the job, and they just need someone else to do the other half. Another type of affiliate you can see is someone that isn't skilled at all. 
they could purchase network access from the network access broker and then purchase ransomware from the developer. And with those two tools, they don't need any skill, any type of knowledge. Now, an average Joe with dark web access can deploy this ransomware on a victim. And again, that kind of increases the amount of actors that you have um, versus before where it would kind of be this threat actor that, you know, created the, the tool and, and pretty much did everything um, his or herself. And then uh, the other type of uh, affiliate I want to talk about are possible nation state threat actors, right? These are threat actors that are backed by um, Russian, Chinese, Iranian governments, and they could be purchasing tools on the dark web um, to kind of further evade attribution. So now that we kind of understand that business model, um, I kind of want to highlight the things that it kind of does to the, you know, the threat landscape. It streamlines, streamlines attacks. So again, you're now being able to... Um, attack at a faster rate because you're you're using this affiliate model no attribution so um originally when the colonial pipeline event happened dark side was being blamed because again you know that was the ransomware that was found on the network but they were they created the ransomware but they didn't necessarily uh deploy it so they weren't really responsible so now the attribution comes into question there's misattribution that can happen too there's lots of um different threat actors using different types of tools. So if we're saying, you know, this is an Iranian tool and we know because the, I, this Iranian threat group has been using it for years, um, now different threat actors can purchase that Iranian tool. They could be Russian. They could have no affiliation with the government. And you misattribute it by thinking, oh, now the Iranians are on my network when um, it was just a tool that was purchased from someone else. So it causes like a lot of confusion. And then, of course, nation state threat actors absolve from blowback because, again, instead of using these customized tools that they develop, um, they can just easily purchase through these affiliate models and um, not really have any finger pointing back at them as being responsible for the attack. And uh, ransomware gangs on the rise. Netwalker, you know, um, they've targeted, you know, electric utilities in the past. Clop, um, Darkside. Again, these are just a couple, you know, there's probably 10 more, you know, Maze and um, Doppelpamer. Um, so, yeah, there's a plethora of ransomware variants and ransomware gangs um, this year than it has been even uh, two years ago. So um, and we're starting to kind of see them pop up a little bit more. Uh, a lot of times they start off working in these uh, affiliate models and then they kind of want to branch off and do their own thing. So dark side, they were originally a part of this other ransomware group and then they decided to develop their own ransomware and now they started their own affiliate program. So you can kind of see um the bigger picture of how our attack services are increasing and then cyber criminals are becoming more organized and then there's a lot of uh, tools that are now um on the rise as well. Okay, and real quick, um, so the executive order is pretty much trying to get the U.S. government more involved when it comes to critical infrastructure and, and cyber attacks, you know, greater transparency, um, ensuring that people are reporting these events. Um, you know, there's several times we've discovered, our team discovered on the dark web, you know, there's a company that's involved in a, a current ransomware attack, and we're seeing data uploaded on the name and shame site, um, and some of our clients are involved, right? But the the victim aren't they're not notifying their clients they're trying to handle it in-house pay the ransom it's very hush hush but uh, obviously there's a lot of um there's a lot of victims not just the one that's being targeted for the ransomware attack so this kind of tries to hold companies more accountable um and kind of trying to kick start this initiative of of getting uh companies comfortable enough to report it without feeling fear of blowback and just more support from the government so they don't feel like they have to pay a ransom Okay, so I'm not going to rehash this incident um, in great detail. I do just want to talk about some three uh, takeaways that we can get from this event. So pretty much May 7th, there was a ransomware event at Colonial Pipeline. Um, we've been being very careful by saying ransomware event and not attack because the word attack has just a different set of implications. I know the media has been using it, but um, there's just no evidence that this was actually a targeted campaign um, because ransomware threat actors are financially motivated and it could have just been uh, an opportunistic thing and not necessarily a targeted attack. But the attack caused Colonial Pipeline to shut down their pipeline. Now, 
the attack itself didn't spread to systems in the in the OT environment and cause the shutdown. Um, what they had was a loss of view and visibility of their billing system. Same thing that happened with when NetWalker attacked that uh, utility in, um, I believe it's Pakistan, where there was loss of view of like billing. So they decided to shut it down, and obviously for fear of the 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 um, ransomware spreading to OT, but there was no um, the ransomware itself didn't cause the shutdown. And um, so later on, we found out that Colonial Pipeline did pay the ransom. They paid like 4.4 million in ransom. And this kind of led to uh, a couple of questions that we've had from companies operating in the space. Like, what does this mean? So I have three takeaways. Um, you pay the ransom, there's a likely chance of increase in cyber threat activity in that space. So um, a couple years ago, I know um, hospi not hospitality, but health, you know, so hospitals, schools, local governments were being highly um, targeted and attacked, not targeted, but highly attacked um, uh, with ransomware. And a lot of them were paying the ransom. And what you're seeing is threat actors kind of flocking to that industry because, hey, we know uh, hospitals, they need all this data to function. So now we know they're going to pay the ransom. Let's just target hospitals. Let's target schools because we know this is going to disrupt their operations. And that's what it does. So what um, paying the ransom did was tell threat actors, we can ask for even more money because it started off with them kind of asking for maybe 200K, 500K to now a company paying 4.4 billion. Um, so, um, so paying the ransom is going to kind of um, make the industry more attractive to threat actors because, again, they're financially motivated. Another takeaway is we taught them that they don't need to target industrial control systems to have a cyber physical effect. Now, not saying that um, snake ransomware and a couple of other uh, variants that target um, industrial control systems, specifically, you know, in destroyer, black energy and all of that. Not saying that we shouldn't be on the lookout for that, but they caused a major shutdown to a pipeline for a week. And all they did was target the IT system. So it was kind of like a, an eye opener as to the impact that a threat actor can have on critical assets, on OT environments without touching the OT environment. So that's pretty huge. And then um, the third uh, takeaway I want to uh, say is it highlights the, the lack of, of policy and regulation in energy, um, again, because now we have this executive order, we have this pipeline directive, and it kind of shows everyone like, wow, so this wasn't being, uh, there was no uh, mandatory reporting of stuff like this before, there was no mandatory regulation. And again, I'll get into the TSA directive to kind of see the things that it highlights, but it's kind of pretty big. Um, when we're kind of showing threat actors our hand and showing them that we're not as secure and regulated uh, from a cybersecurity perspective as they probably gave us credit for. Um, we know, you know, electric utilities in the United States, way more regulated with NERC, FERC, Department of Energy, um, Department of Homeland Security. Um, it's just, you know, I guess it, it just takes certain events to happen for um, for policies to, to be implemented. And uh, last, uh, the pipeline directive, just kind of want to go over what it does. Um, what's huge is it designates a cybersecurity coordinator to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, if there's anyone in the United States that's looking for a job, uh, all these companies are going to be hiring because, again, they have to kind of meet this directive. Um, it kind of allows, it, it kind of forces them to kind of review current practices. Uh, a lot of companies don't have ransomware response plans. Like maybe they'll call incident response, but there are still some things that they have to do to be uh, resilient. And I know some of our, our speakers are going to talk about that a little bit later on. So, um, so yeah, this kind of sums up everything. I'm happy, you know, to, to talk to everyone on the panel. Um, and again, there's a, a little bit more to kind of uh, dive into, but um, but yeah, that's kind of like the snapshot, the trends of the, the cyber threat landscape in energy right now. Thank you. Thank you, Roya. That's fantastic. So we're going to take questions for you at the end of all three presentations. So for now, I'll ask you to take your seat back in the audience and then okay. we'll pull you up at the end of all three presentations. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Right. OK, so next up, we have Alexander Harsh, head of cyber resilience department at E.ON. Uh, so, Alexander, I'm just going to ask you to come and join me on the screen. So Alex is on his way up and just um, some quick background on Alexander. He's the he's responsible for E.ON Cyber Range E. Um, his department are providing cybersecurity consulting to E.ON's DSOs. 
Um, he has supported the design and implementation of certified ISMSCs on the basis of the IT security catalogue of the Federal Network Agency and the international standards ISO IEC 27001 and 27019. And prior to joining EON, Alexander worked for more than 10 years in the management consultancy at PricewaterhouseCoopers in the areas of cyber and forensics. So welcome, Alex. And with that, I will hand over to you to take us through the next 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you, Mandana. So um, basically, as Mandana said, I'm working with uh, grid operators, especially with those of Ian very closely in all types of different um, cybersecurity questions. Regarding the ransomware threat, um, that has been a big topic, not only within Ian's uh, grid companies, but basically over the whole enterprise. And uh, that is basically driven not only by the board, but also by the supervisory board, asking uh, continuously for update, um, what is the risk, uh, what you do, uh, what activities uh, do we carry out, how well are we prepared. Um, why do they do so? Um, of course, uh, Colonial puts another emphasis on the topic, uh, but um, as a European grid operator, um, there has been a couple of events before in the last year, especially with NEL and EDP, one of our um, um, very uh, friendly, um, uh, neighbors were intensively in touch with and uh, so we can see right it's not an American thing it's not a European thing but it's a global uh, threat on, on the energy sector so um, basically activities that have been carried carried out are really all different type of things, the whole uh, bandwidth, right? It's uh, basically uh, being prepared for ransomware attacks, um, that is uh, prevention in times, uh, terms of uh, threat intelligence uh, that we're trying to get uh, from all different ends, uh, onboarding log sources into the SIM to increase the visibility of uh, our SOCs and certs, uh, endpoint, all different type of things, because that's an entry point. Active Directory, I mean, Active Directory deployment of code and, uh, uh, and malware has been a pattern that has been observed before. We've been also doing things to, to, to harden our Active Directory uh, forests. Um, so many preventive actions that have been carried out here. Backup and recovery is, of course, an essential part. Incident response, too. And having said that, um, and now that EDP have been um, affected by this uh, threat, uh, they are both in the uh, European Energy ISAC, as Ian is as well. A very, very good and strong network uh, that allows a cooperation of uh, active participants. And we've been sitting them, with them together, um, talking through playbooks, talking through lessons learned, uh, talking through things uh, that you can do. And also, of course, asking them for what made them so incredibly good uh, in the response uh, to their malware um, uh, attacks that they had, especially um, with the focus on, on the ransomware part of it. I will today now put focus only on backup recovery. Uh, the reason is uh, just that we only have uh, 10 minutes and the whole field is, of course, uh, things you can talk hours about, um, a time that we do not have. Having said that, and then EDP did really, really well in um, replying to the ransomware attack. There was a couple of success factors uh, that allowed it, uh, that they could limit um, the effects uh, of the attack. Um, recovery, recovery capabilities is uh, one of them. Responsibilities is the other thing. Responsibilities in terms of who is actually responsible for applications and services and data. Um, that is uh, the one part. And second, if it comes to disconnecting networks uh, to do a containment, to limit the effects of a ransomware attack to only one segment or to one country, for instance, the separation of, uh, of networks, who can actually do that? You have to be quick, especially if it comes to a attack where the attacker uh, distributes this code via Active Directory. A computer will refresh this Active Directory uh, GPOs every 20 minutes. So the response should ideally occur within the next 20 minutes. Otherwise, it could be that the code will be distributed to basically all um, Windows machines that you have in your network being uh, connected uh, to, to the Active Directory um, domain that is uh, infected. So basically, um, 
what we did we do now in terms of uh, looking at especially these um, uh, silver bullets uh, that there are. First, um, you have to have um, uh, the responsibilities. Uh, we have, um, especially today, a service owner and business owner for each um, applications out there. There exists now a workflow that ensures for each application, for each service, for each machine that there is, you have one IT service owner who does things like uh, patching, who can do uh, get in contact with administrators who can do basically technical things. And then second, there is a business owner who understands all the requirements in terms of availability, uh, confidentiality, basically the typical CIA criteria. This workflow has to be carried out for each and every application uh, that they are there. So this is one. Um, second, of course, having the workflow is nice, but you have to make sure that it gets applied to each and every application. To do so, you have to, of course, wait for new applications coming up that they go through the workflow. But second, of course, for all the existing, you have to discover them. You have to complete the inventory of uh, all assets and then map business owner, IT owner, and CIA uh, criteria. Uh, to make really sure that uh, this inventory is accurate, you have to do, of course, uh, scanning to discover new systems. You have to do scanning to discover old systems nobody has ever talked about. And then second, you have to continuously and repeatedly ensure if one person assigned to a role like a service owner or a business owner, you have to be created again. People change, people leave the company. So it's really a big effort to, to keep this uh, asset inventory uh, complete and um, up to date. Um, once you have a inventory with responsibilities and the requirements that you have, and talking about ransomware, I mean, from the CIA, the C, uh, the, uh, the A, the availability is, of course, uh, the most important part. Um, you have to make sure that whoever operates uh, the system uh, needs, to, needs to be aware of what the requirements are. Um, so there has, has to be a mechanism to transport this to the um, uh, person who actually pushes the button for, for backup and also for the design of the recovery infrastructure. We have uh, automized these ways uh, for many, many of our um, uh, service providers, for cloud service providers, for data center operators. They're all directly connected to our asset inventory, which basically ensures um, that they have the most current up-to-date information that specifies the requirements uh, for, for backup and recovery. Right, so um, once you know, basically everybody who's operating in infrastructure knows exactly what the requirements, so you have to, of course, ensure um, that they also do that in that sense, right? Uh, so you have to monitor it. This is basically part of the internal control system, right? You have to ensure uh, either resources are continuously carried out for whatever reason, or if they haven't, we we'll probably uh, go there and ask them for for test resources. These type of things that are really typical for ISMSs to occur. You also have to have this uh, being done by your third parties if you want to have this uh, confidentiality in, in, in your recovery uh, capabilities. And for us uh, at EN, this is a also a role of the IT service owner, right? He's responsible for the service. He needs to ensure that whoever sits there in front of the backup uh, system makes it possible to fulfill that requirement. And that also includes, and coming down from the CIA, um, we classify our crown jewels, right? Uh, if it comes to crown jewel, um, there is an algorithm to break down CIA into RPO, RTO, but also into a crown jewel. If it comes to a crown jewel, a cold backup needs to be considered because cases have, have occurred where backup media uh, got encrypted. So, I mean, that will have an impact either way, but uh, at least for a certain set of uh, really, really uh, important systems, we have uh, the capability to go into a save and, and grab tapes from there and bring these back um, online. So that's also part of the internal controls that you have. The limit for the um, IT service owner will be, of course, that um, he will ensure requirements are met are for, for, for his application. But of course, there is a bottleneck someplace else, right? And that is the moment where you have a, um, a encryption of maybe hundreds or even thousands uh, of systems, which have occurred uh, quite often already. 
the second question will be, uh, okay, service provider can do it for one system. Can you also do it for a thousand? And a IT service owner can't. He can see only his application. He has insured it for his application. And that is basically where your BCM team or disaster recovery team or whatever you have um, has to uh, jump in and make sure um, that uh, the operator has the capabilities First, in terms of systems, of course, do you have the bandwidth to deploy all, all backups from yesterday or last week or whatsoever? And then second, of course, do you have all the also the people, right? There was going to be each and every entity, each and every IT service owner will call the service provider probably pretty much exactly in the same minute asking for, hey, I need system A with RPO on yesterday. The second will could say, I need system B with RPO of last Saturday, right? You have to collect all that information that takes manpower. And here we're not in typical operations mode, but it's rather a um, disaster recovery uh, type of thing that you, you want to have here at the service uh, provider. Last thing, and I am already at the end of the time, unfortunately, is uh, what we call red button preparedness, because there is a certain set of systems that are outstanding in a way, like all the communication lines from site A to site B, from site A to the data center. I mean, who is actually the business owner of these communication lines? And uh, if it comes to separating segments, you need to have a business owner who can decide on, hey, I'm going to take this connection down, and I know exactly what the business impact is, and know exactly um, how long I can do that. And there is also a mechanism in place. Uh, what do I need to do before I can disconnect these lines? Right? Either I have to talk to somebody in the board or to somebody in the business, or if I cannot reach any of these, I can make the decision by myself within 50 minutes, one hour, um, whatsoever. Right, so these are the main action points. There is one last blind spot that is OT uh, number seven. In Germany, we have the IT security law. OT has to have the ISMSs in place. The ISMSs actually should have their own mechanism in place to make themselves ready for exactly this situation. So the question to be made here for OT, for the core of the grid, um, do you want to trust the ISMSs in place, or do you say, no, I need to have to have some sort of governance over these uh, from a uh, cybersecurity um, uh, view on things? So that is uh, something that you kind of have to uh, make up for yourself and your organization, whether you want to trust these ISMSs or you, whether you want to do something else to get this uh, certainty that you might need. And that's uh, basically it from our side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. That's wonderful. Um, again, I'd like to ask you to take your seat back in the audience, and we'll um, bring you back up when it's time for the questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, so now, last but not least, I'd like to invite up Emil Gurevich, who is the chairman of the Security Committee at the OSGP Alliance. And just to give you some background on Emil and the OSGP Alliance. Hi, Emil. Hi. Welcome. Thank um, you. So, so the OSGP Alliance is the global nonprofit association dedicated to the adoption of the Open Smart Grid Protocol. And Emil helps promote, evaluate, architect, and deploy sec secure smart grids within this context. He has 17 years of experience in identifying and helping remediate security vulnerabilities in critical systems, most recently in the power grid. And previously, Emil has been the security lead at a large utility in Europe. He's also helped develop security solutions at IBM. And he holds an MSc in computer science with specialization in information security. Today, he's also the senior security architect at NESS, where he helps develop secure smart grid products and threat detection solutions. And Emil, if you'd like to share your screen with us, um, I believe you're going to be talking about the most effective technical solutions to guard against next generation ransomware attacks. Thank you, Madonna, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, since I was a teenager, I've been consumed with the thrill of finding new vulnerabilities and writing exploits. Uh, the thrill of outsmarting a system and making it do something that it wasn't supposed to do just never gets old. Uh, I perform vulnerability research and penetration testing, and most recently, as Mandana said, I've been focusing on smart grids. Um, I apply my adversarial skills to help develop smart grid uh, products that are secure and uh, threat detection solutions. 
security is super complex and it's so easy to get lost. So I think it's important that we start with some fundamentals. Cybersecurity is all about maintaining effective risk management. We identify risk uh, by first finding out what needs to be secured, what the threats are, and the likelihood and impact of those threats. Not all threats are equal, and that's important to realize. Uh, you have a finite amount of security budget to spend. You have a finite amount of working hours. So it's extremely important to understand what are the biggest risks to your smart grid at hand. Um, we mitigate risk by implementing or improving existing security controls and initiatives. And finally, the third piece to good risk management is that we evaluate our mitigations. So we need to make sure that the secu security controls and the awareness training that we have put in place are actually working as intended. Now, this may be a little too abstract, but I encourage you to use this kind of as a security compass if you get lost in the weeds of security. Right, so let's talk ransomware mitigations. Um, there is already a lot of really excellent uh, guidance on how to mitigate ransomware attacks. And to me, one resource that stands out is CISA's guidance. Um, CISA is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency uh, in the US, and they just have a really excellent resource on ransomware attacks. So if you haven't already, I strongly recommend that you go to their website and uh, read their ransomware guidance. They go through a lot of the fundamental activities that we should be prioritizing to mitigate ransomware attacks. And you can see some of these here. Uh, and I think each point deserves a little lightning talk on its own. Um, so instead of going through this list right now, I'm more than happy to discuss them during the q and I thought a better use of our time would be to actually go through a real world example of what good cybersecurity risk management can look like in the smart grid space. So I'll be telling a little bit of an anecdote um, from a past professional engagement that I've, that I've made. And um, it all started with some new threat intelligence that tipped the, this electricity utility off that criminals were targeting their smart meters, not necessarily their smart meters, but smart meters in general for financial gains. And here on the right, uh, you see a reporting by Crips on uh, FBI putting out a warning that they are now seeing uh, smart meter hacks from criminal groups. And so this uh, new intelligence triggered the utility to perform a reassessment. So good risk assessment here. They, they see a new threat brewing and they, they look at their own systems and make sure that they understand the risk to them. Um, and here is kind of a very simplified diagram of their networks that they were operating. Um, they, on the far left here, you see the internal networks. And on the right, you have the external parts of those networks. And on the, on the left here, we have their business critical operations. And the SCADA for substation control system is one of those networks. And, um, the smart meter operations is, is another one. And so looking at these new smart meter hacks, they ask the questions, is our skate operations impacted at all? And the uh, answer to that is that that was not the case. Uh, usually these types of systems are also maintained at a much higher regulatory requirement standard. Um, however, the actual AMI network itself uh, was a big question mark for them. They did not have enough information to perform a proper risk assessment for of these new smart meter attacks. So um, what they then did was that they asked me to perform a pen test driven vulnerability assessment of their external AMI network. Uh, they basically put me in front of one of their smart meters connected to a live system, and they wanted it to be as realistic as possible. Uh, they were interested in answers to risk-oriented questions like, what does it take to hack our smart meters? How many meters can you access from one physical location in the external grid? How secure is the network on which the smart meters communicate? Is it possible to gain access to or manipulate with the central operations through a smart meter hack? Is wearable smart meter malware conceivable? And so on. They were all about understanding the impact and effort it takes 
to hack a smart meter network. Now, I can't go into uh, details uh, on the pen test, unfortunately, but um, I can speak to the outcomes. And maybe you can connect the dots. Um, I will say that the penetration exercise here was an eye opener for both the utility and me. I, I never really appreciated how much we actually rely on smart meter networks. Um, and the outcome of this project was a bunch of fixes and improvements uh, to the technical side of the smart metering system, which increased its resilience to attacks. Uh, specifically, core parts of the system was also redesigned to allow for better monitoring and threat detection, which is a key mitigator in these large exposed networks. Uh, the utility came out of this project just being better prepared for future attacks on their AMI systems. Um, this project also created a lot of good awareness within the utilities management group on cyber risk related to smart metering systems. And finally, like understanding your cyber risks is really, really, really important. And in order to do that, you need to understand the systems at hand. And coming back to ransomware, I think that the smart reader system checks a lot of the boxes for future ransomware style attacks. Uh, it provides an essential service for uh, utilities. Uh, they critically rely on smart metering systems to provide uh, data collection as well as grid monitoring. Um, and most smart, smart meter systems, they provide remote control of the power, which if compromised by uh, ransomware crews can be used in leverage uh, during ransomware negotiations. And um, the data that is being collected through these smart meter systems um, is energy consumption, which is part of it at least. And in EU, this is considered uh, personal data and then therefore falls under the GDPR. And this again means that if a ransomware crew can get a hand, uh, uh, um, get access to this data, they can now threaten to leak the data and so forth. It's the same types of tactics we've seen that they employ uh, to, to put more pressure on the utility to, to pay out. And, and finally, uh, the external network itself is large and very exposed. It is also slow to patch. So Roy, Roy brought up the point of these one-day vulnerabilities. Um, just to put this into perspective, in order for a smart meter firmware update with a security fix to reach an entire like hundreds of thousands of meters, it can take months for a whole infrastructure to get up to date. So we're talking about very long windows of uh, potential exploitation. So um, those are just like four aspects, I think that we should be paying attention to uh, as we proceed in, uh, in mitigating future style uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, so I'm coming up on my 10 minutes here, so I will do a, so a few key takeaways here. But again, if you have any questions, I am more than happy to answer them uh, in just a minute. So key takeaways. To mitigate today's ransomware attacks, you need to focus on the fundamentals. Take a risk-based approach and follow available guidance. There's excellent resources out already. For tomorrow's ransomware attacks, I would encourage you to pay attention to the smart meter networks. Sometimes they're not as, uh, sometimes they're overlooked. They may not be receiving the same attention as say their SCADA substation control systems receive, uh, which makes them for a more softer target and more interesting target for ransomware crews. And finally, I hope you will share your concrete examples of successes and failures so we can all improve. Uh, the bad guys are sharing their work and working together, so, so should we. Uh, which is why I really appreciate these uh, these sessions. And um, thanks, Mordana, for, for setting it all up today. That That is my 10 minutes. Uh, I will see you at the Q&A. Thank you very Great. much. Great. Emil, thank you so much. You stay with us here. Yes, definitely right. the good guys should be sharing a lot more um, so that we can get ahead of the, of the threat because there are many more of us than there are of them. So if we shared, we'd be really powerful. 
Love Wonderful. It. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Roya and um, Alex to come back up and then we're going to take a few questions. So um, please continue to post your questions. We have one question here from Pablo. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, uh, please continue to post questions. We want to make sure that we get to, to the heart of all the issues that are concerning you right now. I think ransomware attacks um, well, it seems all the evidence suggests that they are on the increase and we want to make sure the power grid isn't uh, the target of choice for these bad guys in future. So thanks for joining us, Roya. OK, so we have our first question from Pablo Humeris. Um, and Pablo says some companies have adopted as their main security strategy not to have any physical or virtual connections between their operating network and the web. So remote service access. Um, is only performed within the company's own physical environment, which belongs to the operating network without any connection to the IT. What's your view on this strategy and who would like to kick off with an answer there? Alex, go ahead. So um, seeing, and I do consulting work not only for Ian, but also basically all diff different type of grid uh, companies uh, in, in Germany and Europe, I think uh, today this is uh, not a realistic idea to have them physically uh, separated. Looking in the future, I mean, today everybody is talking about data lakes, uh, smart uh, leading of grids, predictive maintenance, all of that you need to get data out of the grid and load it into a central place, typically the cloud. So maybe there is still some out there who have them completely disconnected. Uh, that might be possible, but they're most likely not going to be in five years from today. So I think this is really an old story and not applicable anymore today. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard to stop the stem of um, the flow of progress once we've started down this avenue. Um, Roya, Emil, do you have any views on this at all? Yeah, I do know that a few years ago, a report came out um, saying that there were a lot of USB devices that were already embedded with malware. So, you know, people were thinking, oh, we have an air gap environment and we're using USB. But, you know, if that's not being tested, you could also be uploading, um, you know, malware into those systems as well. So, yeah, I don't think it's realistic to have a fully air gapped environment. And especially now, this was a few years ago. But like you said, now with every everything moving to the cloud and integration and industrial Internet of Things, yeah, I, I don't think it's um, it's realistic. Okay, Emil, anything to add to that? No, I I would just echo what uh, the Roya and Alexander said. That makes sense. Okay, great. So we have a question here from Maria Tours. Does anybody have any idea how many bad guys there are? <laughs> <laughs> What's the universe? What's the population of bad guys? That's a good question. <laughs> that is, I would say there's no clue. So I tried to kind of um, give everyone a snapshot by kind of talking about those affiliate programs. But because of those programs, there's now a lot of unskilled people that can be threat actors by just purchasing these tools and the access on the dark web. So that um, it just opens up you know, for there to be more threat actors. And, you know, back in the day when there was Stuxnet and a couple of other attacks, it was traditionally thought like, okay, these threat actors are going to be backed by a nation state. And then it's like, okay, well, they're cyber criminal gangs. And now it could just really be anybody. So mm -hmm. that's a little bit scary. And then, you know, everyone ha has their own goals, you know, so there's some threat actors that are financially motivated, you know, a lot of the cyber criminals, others, um, you know, they want to cause some type of disruption, some type of cyber physical effect. Then you have your hacktivist. So um, everyone has different motives. Everyone has different skill levels. But the availability of these tools to be sold on the dark web just makes it easier for them to, to carry out their attacks. So it's we'll just assume it's a lot. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Anyone with a grudge basically has yeah. to, <laughs> to take action on that level. Um, OK, we have another question from Roland Hill here. What's the role and activity of the UK NCS, NCSC securing the grid? I could, I could answer that for, for the German National Cybersecurity Center, um, uh, the BSI, uh, as it's called. And uh, I know the, U the UK and the US, they have way more uh, capabilities in, in that area. But um, I think also from a European perspective, um, threat intelligence, sharing, collaboration, much, much is being done to 
get the network going, make uh, threat intelligence uh, be shared, uh, create platforms, create tools where great uh, utilities can share. And uh, in Germany, the National Cybersecurity Center is just one of many players. They're always correct, but they're always two weeks ahead in the, uh, back in the game. So yeah, of course you read the bulletins from the BSI, but it's not the one thing that's gonna help you. I know in Germany we have now a, a um, incident response team. It basically consists of uh, grid companies and critical infrastructure uh, folks all over the place. You can assemble it quickly and do that under the umbrella of the National Cybersecurity Center. But uh, I would uh, not solely rely on the help of the BSI, at least not in, not in Germany. Yeah, OK. And, and for the power grid environment, we have groups such as E. Isaac, which you're a member of, um, Alex, who look at trusted networks, who look at the power grid environment specifically and the threats that are inherent to that environment and what's on the horizon. So um, what, what's your view on how effective those types of groups can be in protecting the grid in future? Well, I'm personally a believer of the idea of, of, of the European uh, energy ISAC and also, as I said before, right, I mean, you here is somebody has been under attack where we can give ourselves a call, we can share confidential information under the umbrella of the ISAC and it's very, very helpful. It's, uh, it's very helpful. Honestly. Yeah, and very customized to the grid environment specifically, which is quite a specialized environment. Okay, fantastic. Um, Roya, um, what are some of the surprising threat trends that you've been seeing lately? This is from Emil. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so um, I would say that, you know, basic cyber hygiene being um, underestimated. So I've analyzed the past few attacks, especially the Colonial Pipeline one. And mm -hmm. it's like, OK, the threat actor stole credentials and they used it. And, you know, the account wasn't even active and there was no MFA. And a lot of times when, um, you know, especially talking to companies that have OT environments, everyone's so focused on how do we secure OT? They want mm -hmm. comprehensive tools. They want, right. you know, all of this stuff, which is great. You know, definitely there needs to be more visibility and security in OT environments. But it doesn't mean um, let's not try to implement basic cyber hygiene, because a lot of ways that these threat actors are getting in, it's from... Um, you know, just basic IAM, um, VPN, just basic kind of security, um, you know, employees clicking on spear phishing links and things like that. So it, it, it's just, it, well, it's not funny, but it's just interesting how as much as we kind of preach cyber hygiene, um, a lot of companies still aren't implementing it. And, you know, they're, in, they're growing their cybersecurity um, programs and even cyber threat intelligence programs, mm -hmm. but they're not doing like the basic things that it takes to mm -hmm. secure their networks. And now we see implications in the OT environments because of not being secure in their IT. So I would say um, the past couple of events, that's the trend that I've been seeing. And it's more on that. That's why I think there's been a lot of attacks that could have been prevented. Um, so, yeah. 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 And it really, it really requires every single employee to be to have such a heightened level of awareness about cybersecurity, which is probably a place we're not at right now. That's that's a big gap to fill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Emil. Yeah, thanks. The great answer. And it also rings true for me as an attacker. Like we're still if we're targeting IT environments, we'll still the first thing we reach for is social engineering by email, phishing, water holing, et cetera. The same yeah. things we've been doing for so long and they're still effective. So I completely I completely agree. That's also what I'm seeing. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Christian Kakulo here, who says, hello, everybody, great presentations. I'd like to know about the about your experience or knowledge regarding artificial intelligence assisting smart grid security. Any thoughts on that? Um, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, so I, I work within like technology and AI comes up a lot. From a security perspective, I think it has its use cases, but it's very important not to get distracted. Um, we just talked about getting the basics right, and um, and a AI can actually be a distraction from um, spending time on getting the basics right. Uh, it's very important for AI where you, you understand where the strengths are and where, what the applications are before you jump into a project and, and spend a lot of money and time uh, on something that might not actually have a, a successful effect. Um, so 
It depends is unfortunately the answer here. But I would say a big pitfall is to just jump on the AI bandwagon and try to solve everything with it and you're going to get distracted. Right. Okay. Um, and a question here from Dan. Um, do we believe that most power um, and grid operators have already deployed monitoring systems in their estates? What do you believe is the current status and how effective have, been, have these been? So I can kind of, you know, talk to that. As much as, you know, um, I did say that uh, the electric sector space, uh, at least in the United States, is more highly regulated. There's a lot more policies and accountability in that space in comparison to like oil and gas. Um, it's still very new. So when I, I was working at Idaho National Laboratory a few years ago, and we were starting to, um, we were doing a lot of pilot projects to get monitoring and, you know, all of that stuff. And that was a few years ago. So I wouldn't, and, and of course there's like budgeting, there's planning, there's, you know, there's, you know, everyone's trying to compete to get funding to, to implement these things. So I wouldn't say that um, a lot has been implemented and I don't know the status of, of how it's going, but I just know that it, it was kind of ramping up and uh, utilities were starting to do it a few years ago. So I don't know if anyone else has any insight into that. Okay, so another question here from Dan. Um, what do you believe are the key pain points in OT security for renewable generation specifically? Um, and why are these so difficult to solve? Now from uh, looking uh, 20 years back in time, things were so incredibly easy with uh, a few power plants with a clear information flow. And uh, today it's just no, not so much predictable, right? I mean, you have uh, so many components, you have uh, producers, you have necessity to talk, uh, networks increase, um, many, many business ideas, much more pressure also in terms of uh, pricing, um, USPs uh, to the to the client, uh, so the world changes dramatically fast. And that is something that has never been considered in the grid because uh, from the 90s uh, to um, 10 years ago, hardly anything changed. People were just doing exactly the same thing they did uh, last year in the 10 years before. And that's when mm -hmm. also from the change the mindset in the tools, the requirement, the nature, and the change is very difficult for, for us human beings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say also um, with with the rise of, of renewable, everything being connected to the power grid. So, you know, you have people with their own solar panels and electric cars. And um, so I know that that's things that I know Idaho National Laboratory was looking at and Accenture. You know, what are the implications of an infected vehicle hooking up to the power grid um, and what does that look like? So I think a lot of it is still being explored when it comes to renewables. Um, so so maybe in a year or so we'll kind of maybe have some better analysis on, on what that looks like. But I, I know that there's lots of um, testing right now to kind of see what does this mean and how do we kind of secure, um, you know, all these devices being connected to the power grid. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I Definitely there's a bunch of different technology stacks um, and different vendor implementations of the same standard. And it's in the joinery of all these systems where there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of attack surface. So uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be very interesting to see how things progress. Okay, and one final question before we wrap up. Um, it seems fair to assume that ransomware attacks in the in ICS are always possible. Can you please elaborate on which resilience techniques are being used to withstand these, these attacks? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, from a, it's hard to block attacks. Uh, you can do what you, you know, you can do go through these, um, these guidance and ransomware guidance and these, you know, fundamentals to get trying to block them from happening. But I think it's important to realize that you also have to think about detection and response, mm -hmm. um, getting good monitoring. We see that a lot of attackers are in networks, analyzing the networks from the inside to find out where the crown jewels are. And every time they touch the keyboard, it's an opportunity for the threat detection system or the blue team to catch them in the act and shut them mm -hmm. down. And mm -hmm. I think that is a very key part of a resilience uh, strategy is to, to make sure that you always put doubt in the attacker's mind uh, that every time I pivot to a new system or I do a port scan on this type of system or I use credentials to access to this other type of system, you need to you need to have them think like oh shoot what is what if this is, is a honeypot or what if some detection yeah. system catches me if mm -hmm. you can if you play security right you'll get them to move much slower and more carefully 
and that's exactly how you you play the security game uh, from from where I sit, and I, right, I look right. at it from an attacker's perspective. Yeah. So an incident response, Alexander. I know you have a really cool thing that with the cyber range, um, and I think that's excellent. Where you actually test your incident response planning, you go through these war gaming exercises where you kind of simulate an attack and you share notes, blue and red share notes afterwards and see where, where both can improve. I think that is that is exactly the right mindset uh, on building a, a resilient uh, cybersecurity posture. Great, thank you for that, Emil. That's, that's a great answer. That actually gives a lot of um, hope as to the, the solutions that can combat these attacks. Okay, well, I think this is a good point um, in which to wrap up. So thank you all very much for your contributions and for taking the, um, and to our audience for putting such great questions forward as well. I hope it's been a really enjoyable and productive experience for everyone. So as I mentioned earlier, we'll be sending you an email shortly with a link to download all the PowerPoint slides here. Also to answer a few questions to help us improve the quality of these programs going forward. Um, and also do let your colleagues know that we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel in a few days so they can catch the replay if they missed uh, the live event. Um, and then finally, we're taking a break for a couple of months over July and August, but we'll be back at the end of September with our webinar on supply chain attacks, combating supply chain attacks. So look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks very much. Have a great evening and see you on the platform soon. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.